Uh, hi, I'm Rachel Horn. Uh, I head policy communications for Protocol Labs. We are a blockchain R&D firm, totally remote, building Web3 protocols. And I am joined here by two super smart panelists. I have Kumar Garg. He's the managing director and head of partnerships at Schmidt Futures, Schmidt Futures, previously with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy under the Obama administration. I also have Eli Dorado, a senior research fellow at the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. Um, he uh, previously was with uh, Boom Supersonic, heading policy and communications, and he was a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. So welcome to you both. Thanks, Rachel. Great to be with you. Thanks for having us. And I, Kumar. Yeah. So let's start because the panel of the, the topic of this panel, which is hard tech and innovation, may throw some people off. So Kumar, uh, give you give you can start us off by telling us what's the distinction in Silicon Valley between hard tech and soft tech. Yeah. So the reason why people make this distinction is principally a lot of what's associated with Silicon Valley um, and the rise of tech is uh, software. So if you think about some of the predominant companies in the space, so uh, Google, um, obviously Amazon on the, on the website side, um, Facebook, these are predominantly software companies, as in they built a piece of code. Um, software has some major advantages uh, that we've been living over the past 20 years. So one of the most important ideas behind software is that it has zero marginal cost. So once you actually develop the code to run, getting one more customer, one more user uh, costs you fractions of a, uh, of a cost. And so it allows you to build these highly scalable businesses. A lot of the venture capital model that people talk about is built on this model, which is that if you do the upfront investment in building a potentially breakthrough product, you can get orders of multiple of value downstream and then these kind of speculative bets where one out of a hundred or one thousand one out of a thousand businesses um, do really well uh, works the distinction is made between uh, that's the soft part the hard tech is framing around technologies that are predominantly physical so if you can think driverless cars uh, uh, getting uh, SpaceX and getting things into space uh, you know, uh, a whole range of battery technologies. These are all hard tech problems and hard tech solutions in the sense that they involve the, biz the building of physical technology. And the building of physical and scaling of physical technology has different dynamics. And so often there's a distinction made uh, in the innovation space between the, uh, you know, software oriented businesses versus hard tech. And one of the things I'm looking forward to this conversation is both the potential of hard tech, but also the intersection between that and software. So before we dive deeper uh, into some of those challenges, um, I would love to sort of spin out for a few minutes, which industries you think, you two both think are, are poised for greatest disruption by hard tech. Um, so is it healthcare, is it education, is it aer aerospace? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's, uh, it's the, the four sectors that I look at the most when I think about like productivity stagnation are, are health, uh, housing, uh, energy, and transportation. Now, housing, I think mostly it's a uh, it's a reg it's a regulatory problem. There are uh, technical solutions uh, to to solve our housing productivity issues. But if you look, if you just sort of like separate that out, it's 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 health, it's uh, transportation, and it's energy. And if you kind of focus on those those three, like you're going to get a big bang for your buck. And uh, and be able to you know get a lot of uh, productivity uh, out of those and uh, you know those as as Kumar was saying like those are very different from software right there in in particular those are highly regulated industries uh, unlike software which has benefits from the protection of you know the First Amendment in some cases uh, Section two thirty um, and and you know that's that does not exist in in these uh, hard tech sectors. Can can you just unpack a little bit more sort of what the hard tech looks like in healthcare? Like what, what's sort of the best case scenario? Well, I think the best case scenario is like we all live much longer than we are currently living, uh, disease free. Uh, we spend way less money on healthcare. Right now we spend 18% of GDP on healthcare. A lot of the healthcare debate in DC is focused on like, who's gonna pay that 18%, uh, you know, and that's a valid debate, but like no one is focused on like, how do we get that 18% down to something like, you know, five or 6%. 
um, yeah, how do we, so essentially how do we triple productivity in healthcare? Uh, and, and so I, I think it's, um, you know, the, the best case scenario is, uh, you know, much more effective treatments for just about everything uh, that doesn't re actually require a lot of medical spending. In some cases, it could be consumer devices that enable you to diagnose and treat yourself. Um, but ultimately, it's you, you spend less time uh, requiring human doctors and human intervention in your health. Yeah. I mean, I, the other part, given that we're living through the COVID pandemic, to always remember is, uh, you know, narrowing and slowing the downside risk, right? So we are losing trillions of dollars of economic activity because we do not have the technology to rapidly develop and deploy vaccines. This has been an ongoing grand challenge in the space, which is, you know, I remember one of the first uh, reports that the PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors in Science and Tech did in 2009 was, hey, we have a, even in the most optimistic scenarios, we have an 18 to 24 month model for how to develop a new vaccine. You know, that was a report in 2009. We are living through that today. And so getting better at being able to do these things also reduces the risk of the next set of challenges that we may face as a society. And then that's relevant to us being able to do all the other productive work that's out there. So I think biotechnology has both the potential for us to directly improve human life, you know, so, uh, but it also potentially the downside risks around you know, a populist planet. Um, Mark Andreessen wrote a, um, an essay that published in the spring um, after the coronavirus pandemic, like really sunk its teeth into the U.S., talking about this, um, you know, this failure of imagination and this institutional decline in innovation and in tech. And to quote uh, Gary Shapiro from the Consumer Technology Association, where I came from before PL, um, his big takeaway, take his message was always innovate or die, that if you're not innovating, then you're stagnating. So um, Kumar sort of, I, you know, I would, and he, he, he all throughout that essay talked about the um, impact in healthcare and why we don't have the masks and like the very simple things. There's the hard things and the simple things. The hard things make sense why we don't have those, why we haven't come up with the um, vaccines for this pandemic, but the simple things, we don't have those at our disposal either. So I'm wondering sort of, what you make of this and Kumar, I'll start with you and, and what you think policy makers can do to promote hard innovation. Yeah, so I think what's what's interesting about that paper and sort of the end recent call is one, I think it's like just interesting in the like um, story of Silicon Valley because he's also associated with software eating the world. And so um, it's somebody who's talking and writing about this larger vision for what where innovation needs to exist. It's not just about uh, bits, but it's also about atoms. But I think the other part that's actually interesting is actually marrying his view with the important role of institutions. So I think like when people look at the story of SpaceX, you know, there's many different stories one could tell about SpaceX. One version is it's an, it's an incredible entrepreneur breaking into a pretty regulated sector where we have very strong safety rules and many other rules. And now SpaceX is more than half of all, 50% of all launches around the world, right? So they they went from a total new to like an industry dominant player. But one of the things that I think was an institutional innovation under the hood was NASA during the early part of the Obama administration actually basically put SpaceX through what are called a set of milestone based payments. So they said, you know, if we just said, you know, the way you get a NASA contract is you have to show us a track record of safety of getting astronauts into the space station. Well, guess what? Only a handful of companies can show pre-existing safety records to do that because they already exist. They also didn't say, well, we should just let you do whatever you want. They said, okay, well, we're gonna come up with these like, you know, two dozen milestone markers and in each one you'll get the next payment to keep going. And that actually put SpaceX through a trajectory where they were able to hit all those markers. And so I think one of the interesting things is like, if we're gonna make it possible for new entrepreneurs, especially on these sort of hard tech challenges to be able to develop, we actually have to give them, you know, um, the, the capital to be able to do that, but do that in a way where, you know, they don't go broke along the way. And so, you know, one of the ideas that I think, you know, the um, has come up is this idea that like, should we be doing advanced marketing commitments uh, 
in the biotech space. So the idea being that like, so mass is a good example. Part of the reason why there's a huge deficiency for mass production in the early parts of the pandemic is people who had developed mass in previous uh, crises had basically retrofitted their factories and then gone out of business. Because then, you know, the, the situation got solved and then they weren't, there wasn't that much demand for masks and so it wasn't worth it. You could make a pre-commitment that you will buy a huge uh, order of masks so that you know that you can, if you retrofit your factory, you can get your order filled. You can actually demand, uh, you know, you know, there's a set of folks who are actually building, you know, what they call N99.99 masks, which are masks that are not just 95%, but are basically uh, at the 99 percentile. You can actually demand that innovation if you actually set up the right set of government structures um, to drive that private innovation. And so I think that's the question that I think at least it triggers for me, which is how do you take that time to build and actually then think, what are the set of uh, institutional characteristics you need to actually pull that off? Yeah, I think Kumar is uh, absolutely right uh, on all counts. So gladly uh, will associate myself with his remarks. Um, uh, you know, in particular, I'm gratified that you noticed a little bit of attention there with, you know, with uh, Silicon Valley funding software companies to to a significant extent, and and then and then complaining that we don't have all this like non software innovation. Um, you know, Mark is a great is a great uh, person. I w love him to death, but uh, he, uh, you know, I think he's, you know, it's like he hasn't funded the, the the stuff that he that he wants, and so let's let's find ways to fund it. I agree that there's a government role there. Um, I think uh, also on the policy side, I think it's like really important to do like a lot of the deeply unsexy work of fixing like things like permitting, which can take years, uh, you know, for to to do like uh, any sort of like meaningful permitting of, you know, uh, one of the things I've been focused on is like geothermal wells and like why is it why does it take longer to build a geo or to get a permit for a geothermal well than it does to take to do an oil and gas well that's the exact same well. Um, it's because like there's a specific carve out for that uh, on federal lands. Uh, things like you know like the permitting that the, like the boring company has to do if they want to um, build a tunnel between DC and Baltimore. It's like you know they they basically have to write hundreds of pages to prove that they don't have an environmental impact. And then you know at the end of the day like it will it will get approved, but that's like the stage they're at now, and that's why they're not doing it. Uh, like procurement is like another area. Uh, Kumar I think makes a great point on on SpaceX uh, versus like the past way of doing things. And, and actually not just the past way of doing things, but the, the, the current way we're still doing things with with uh, programs like the Space Launch System, which is like the latest Boeing rocket that um, that NASA uh, has procured from them. Um, and, and then on the defense side as well, procurement is like really big. So it's a lot of like really unsexy things that you kind of have to fix, uh, you know, permitting, uh, procurement, um, things like like changing the regulatory structure from Pre-market approval to post-market surveillance. Um, you know, it's it's not gonna it's not it's not gonna be, ever be like a, a sexy talking point, but it's like really important work that we need to do if we want to if we want to be able to improve our institutions and be able to build. I mean, one example, I'll, additional example I'll give is I remember when um, you know Department of Energy launched this um, you know uh, solar challenge and the and the cost. This was in, you know, now it seems sort of inevitable. Like, oh my God, look at this like trend line for cost of sale solar as it's like gotten cheaper than basically all the forms of energy. But there was a time when it was, you know, it was not that. And they set this very ambitious goal. Uh, and one of the things that they actually found when they did an analysis was the soft costs of solar deployment were becoming an ever increasing share of its deployment costs. So. You know, even as the photovoltaics were getting cheaper and you're getting these huge unit productions, you know, you still need permitting, you still need the cost of actual deployment. And you actually have to think about all of those in the actual cost of a, of a technology. And I think sometimes people forget that and then they say, well, why aren't we seeing more of X? And so I just think that as technologists, we have to take, um, you know, we have to, we have to have a sophisticated view uh, of what is actually happening, what would drive more adoption. I think for folks who really care about uh, climate technologies, this is gonna matter a lot because you actually have to think about what is gonna be the barrier to deployment and what are ways that you can actually drive it. Uh, there's uh, you know, Saul Griffith who wrote this uh, recent paper on rewiring America. And one of the big things 
he sort of posits is that it's actually about like how can you finance your home upgrade, you know? So like getting your home into a, a set of much more uh, climate friendly technologies will probably cost your home 30 to 40K. You will make that money back in seven to eight years. That kind of looks like a home mortgage, you know, but that you actually have to develop that product. The 30 year mortgage was actually a construction of the state. And what are ways that if you actually want to make this stuff, you have to mix technology, financial engineering, and uh, social goods. That's super interesting. Um, Eli, you you started. That's that was that's super interesting. I never thought about that. Um, those soft costs. Um, I, we started to veer into policy, but I do want to um, put the onus a little bit back on industry for a moment. Um, Eli, you, I believe your um, advisor at George Mason was Tyler Cowen, and he obviously talks quite a bit about the great stagnation. And I'd love to hear um, your take about, um, you know, whether you believe that we're in a technological st stagnation and, and what do we have to do to break that cycle? Um, so yes, I mean, I mean so Tyler uh, wrote this great book in 2011 uh, called The Great Stagnation, where he says, if you look at total photo factor productivity, which is, I think, the best metric of economic growth. It, it's um, essentially a metric that takes says how much value of output are you getting for a fixed basket of you know representative inputs, and and in the 1950s and 60s we were growing at about a rate of about two percent. In 1973 there was this abrupt shift where it started growing at about one percent. Um, I think there's actually been a, a worse <laughs> uh, a shift uh, more recently since about 2005. We are growing at about 0.26%. So over the last 15 years, we are growing at one eighth of the rate that we were growing at in the 1950s and 60s. And, and this is an important metric to think about because it abstracts away from the idea of like, oh, we're just having more people added to the labor force, right? So, so in the 1970s and 80s, you know, was fortunately a, a time when lots of women were able to join the, the labor force and so on. And so we got economic measured economic growth by simply like applying more labor, uh, but we didn't necessarily get more output uh, in a productivity sense and sort of output per person and output per resources. So it it's um, it is a, you know it is a very real stagnation and it's and like I said it's it's gotten uh, <laughs> worse in the in the last fifteen years uh, and and you know to get out of it I do think I do I do think there's a policy role in that but it is I think all hands on deck we need industry. We need culture uh, and government all aligned behind the goal of increasing productivity, um, and and you know to some extent that that you know I, it, it's hard to blame like Silicon Valley for it, right? That they're they're chasing uh, returns. Um, they want returns that happen very quickly, right? Like like you know in, in the software model. You have a small team. They build something. They get to a minimum viable product within like a year or two, and then they scale it up, and and the investor makes money. Um, you know, in a in a hard tech industry, you know, you, you it's, it can take years to get to. You, it, you probably don't have a, a minimum viable product that's, you know, um, that can be developed quickly, and and you have to basically build the whole product, um, and that takes that takes a lot of time, and and you know the time component of that rate of return calculation, it, you know, dominates and, and makes it very hard for them to fund. So, so we need new, you know, probably new funding models. One thing I think um, maybe a bright spot has been, we've had this sort of like billionaire patronage model of, of innovation. So you have Jeff Bezos funding uh, Blue Origin, um, which he's not doing because it's a good, you know, a financial bet, he's, like the rate of return on that is, is not high, um, but it is, um, you know, it, I think it is a, a, a good uh, a good development, and maybe it gets us back to some point. You know, like in the Renaissance, where you had you know very wealthy families uh, funding public goods. Um, but it would be better if if all of our public goods provision was focused on um, on on faster on faster growth and increasing the the rate of productivity. That's that to me is is the the most uh, the most important thing we can do to. To not only um, you know improve the economy and, and our quality of life, but also like maybe to make our politics less divisive. Um, you know, if, if we actually have had close to zero growth in the last fifteen years, then is it any wonder that, that we have large populations that act as if the world is zero sum? Um, you know, so so actually faster growth, I think, can 
uh, could improve, you know, it can, could be a sort of like self reinforcing thing where, where we start to see the world as more positive sum and, and, you know, therefore become able to, uh, to grow even faster. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's a couple of different things. I think one thing that I think industry can do is um, I think when industries organize themselves and are able to um, accurately sort of state their pre-competitive R&D priorities, it's actually quite useful. So the semiconductor industry uh, did this uh, early on where they said, you know, at some point we're going to run out of Moore's law. Here are the sets of things that we collectively as an industry are never going to individually invest in, but are important R&D priorities. And that actually helped you know, the U.S. government and others kind of get work with industry on sort of building an R&D roadmap that sort of extended out past the industry. So I think that kind of work ends up being very useful. I think a second place where industry can play a useful role is I think, um, you know, there's a there's an element of like, what is it that, uh, you know, what are the big sort of internal areas that companies think uh, they can really drive on and sort of advantaging those. So what is their core R&D capacity sort of focused on? And I think often, you know, companies when they're sort of talk, engaging in the public dialogue, they're talking about, you know, here's what, here's our sort of financials for the quarter. You know, they're not sort of leading with, here's what we're working on that could become the next transformative industry. I think one open question is to what extent does uh, COVID-19 change and sort of kind of restack on what people sort of lead with when it comes to what they're investing in. It's possible that this is gonna lead to a range of new investments in biotech, but it could lead to a range of how companies say they wanna position their future R&D investments in going forward because the world is uh, hard to predict and they actually wanna say, oh, we're actually gonna be building in more internal R&D capacity because, you know, just thinking that we're gonna be dominant in whatever sector and it's gonna remain exactly the same uh, is gonna be an open question. Um, you know, I think the other area is that like, I think, especially for the US, the US is a talent magnet for the rest of the world. It, it gets top STEM professionals around the world to come to the US. I think in the past few years, US companies kind of woke up to the fact that they shouldn't just necessarily just expect that will always happen. They actually have to advocate for high scale immigration, for an immigration system that actually brings uh, talented folks to the United States and that those things can actually go away if they're not making the case for them. And that's, I think, a huge part of um, the American uh, story. And so I think there's a number of different ways where companies can sort of play a leadership role. I think the part that is hardest is this idea that we're gonna immediately sort of go back to like a Xerox PARC, internal, internal to companies, large R&D labs. I think there might be some instances where that's gonna happen, but uh, I think it's much more likely to happen in cooperation with uh, with you know the the federal government and other players. So, and I should just note that Protocol Labs is one of we are aiming to be one of these Xerox Park type places that's churning out all kind. We have a huge R and D investment and a whole research team that's looking into this. But yes, it is an interesting model that I, I don't see at many other companies these days. But I do want to take this uh, moment to take that international look, U.S. versus other countries. Are we still leading in innovation? Um, you know, where do we see the competition? Who's taking, you know, where do we see the competition for students and for skills and talent? Um, and, and sort of what's our relationship with China and what does it look like in this, in this next administration? Start with you, Eli. Uh, great question. So, um, I mean, China is clearly like not complacent, right? Like, like so they, uh, so we, we've been complacent on uh, in a lot of, in a lot of areas uh, and they are not. I, you know, I think the U.S. still has a lot of strengths relative to China, uh, sort of like long-term structural strengths. Um, you know, they have, in, in a lot of ways, China is very weak uh, in terms of, you know, they sort of have this like internal financial house of cards that they've built, uh, which could collapse at any moment. They are dependent on, you know, on foreign energy and, and even food supplies. And um, so, and so in that sense, like, you know, they have some weaknesses, but I think that they are um, they are very formidable, uh, and you know, particularly, um, they're very serious about wanting to dominate, uh, sort of like the part of Asia that's uh, you know near them. Um, and 
and and they're gearing sort of like the entire uh, industrial capacity of their economy to be able to do that. And and you know we should take that seriously. Uh, we should you know sort of like I, I, I'm not really I, I don't know if I'm a hawk on China, but I, I would say um, we should you know, certainly leverage the the boogeyman aspect of China to sort of like shock ourselves out of the complacency that we have in order to try to innovate more and and uh, you know rise to the challenge that they that they pose in terms of um, in terms of global governance and 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 so on. So I think I think you know they they've done some very impressive things um, in terms of like their their built speed of build out of high speed rail I think is something that's really interesting to me. Uh, they they're building you know they built twenty five thousand kilometers of high speed rail in like a decade, um, at, you know for much lower cost than than you know I think we would be able to do it. Um, and and so they yeah they're they're very, they're very serious um, about about not being complacent and. Um, we should we should definitely you know learn from from their example uh, as far as that goes. Yeah, I mean, I think in in general, I think the important place to start on international is that at least from a science perspective, um, global the global picture is additive, not so. What you want is strong R and D centers around the world lots of smart researchers working on this. So if you just take the COVID response, the fact that you have a global response from the R&D community is net positive in a huge way for the United States, right? Ultimately, if they're... Um, and so I think generally strong science cooperation uh, is a really strong value add. I do think the United States has just been a draw for talent uh, and capital. And so that has given it strong advantages in the system because it's able to cluster that talent and it's able to cluster that talent and that's why so so much of the major companies and new starts are happening in the uh uh in the united states so i think the the china question is i think a hard one partly because we have to disentangle which of the which of the sub areas of technology where us losing our competitive capabilities puts us at, at, at serious risk from a national security and economic security standpoint down the road. And one thing we find about R&D is you, once you lose internal capacity, it's hard to get it back. We found this with advanced manufacturing where once the supply goes abroad, actually you don't, you getting it back to the United States actually is much harder than you think. So I think we just have to think hard about what are the areas where we just were asleep at the, at the wheel and actually build back that capacity. And hopefully we can do it in a cooperative terms uh, but I think uh, certainly just sort of thinking things will work out is not going to help anybody. Yeah. Let's talk about funding um, and whether um, do you think that like the private sector VC funding is sufficient? Um, sort of what are the roles of some of the government agencies like NSF or NIH or DARPA um, to support hard tech? Where are the gaps? Whoever wants to take it first. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so clearly, there have been some hard tech fund, hard tech companies funded by VC. So it's like it's like possible, right? But uh, but I don't think it's happened at the sort of the, the scale that we need it uh, to happen at. So, um, and, and I think this is just driven by the sort of rate of return calculation that I, I mentioned earlier. It's just not fast. You're not able to get the returns fast enough uh, relative to what the the VC, VC companies. Um, want um, you know, so I think there's there is a role for uh, alternative funding mechanisms you know could you know from billionaires just funding like hobby companies uh, like Sir, Sergey Brin has an airship company which is awesome um, but then also like government government funding you know I think at my sense I'm not an expert in uh, you know NSF NIH etc but uh, you know NIH has a 40 billion dollar budget and you know that's that's a lot of money we should be getting a lot of return for that uh, it's not obvious to me that that's that's being spent like super efficiently. It takes months to apply for an NIH grant, um, so so the, the whole process moves very slowly. Uh, I think one idea that I think is is really interesting for a way that government could fund some of this sort of transformative innovation is something that Tom Khalil mentioned on Friday uh, on, on one of these panels, which is uh, 
uh, the idea of focus research organizations that uh, Adam Marblestone came up with. I'm really uh, bullish on that. So the idea is you you take have a, um, a, a an organization set up for the purpose of making some big transformative breakthrough that's well specified and they're funded by either philanthropy or by government to solve that problem in an intense and cross disciplinary way. Uh, and then when it's done, it disbands. So I think that that would be a, a really interesting model of you know take you know, 50 to $100 million and go, go solve something that would be transformative. And then, you know, maybe spawn, you know, uh, a, you know, a handful of companies maybe at the end of the day that actually go and, and productize that, that breakthrough. So I think that that's, that's a really interesting model and something we should look, look uh, more, more at in the future. The other thing Tom Khalil mentioned on Friday that I just delighted in and have been thinking about all weekend is that, um, students, when they go to college, uh, should take, consider a major, but also tackle a problem, take a problem and take that on. And um, because that, those are the jobs that we get when we come out of school. You don't get a like history or philosophy uh, job. You get a help me solve this problem job. Uh, so I think that could help in this hard tech area. Kumar, I, didn't, I don't mean to step on your toes. Tell, talk to, tell us what you think about this funding challenge, where it should come from. Yeah, I mean, I sort of think about it as like a pyramid. You know, at the base of the pyramid are the the sort of core R and D investments that the government makes. And I think there's lots of great ideas that are coming up around what are ways that we can make those investments. And I think we need to, you know, boost our R and D budget. We're falling behind, especially on a you know GDP rate compared to our historical uh, averages, and certainly compared to you know kind of the space race period of the American. Uh, uh, sort of 20th century, but also compared to like China and a number of other major economies. So I think one is we need to boost the core rate, but I also think like a number of innovations that the field is coming up with should be experimented with, right? Like let's have more of these focus features organizations. Let's invest in more platform technologies and tools, right? So one of the big things that I always find interesting is like we invest in the research, but not the tools that drive the research, even though the tools end up being the, the like the thing that ends up driving a lot of productivity. So, uh, you know, CRISPR is ultimately a tool that allows much faster, uh, you know, around around gene editing. So like, what are ways that we are investing in the tools, the platform technologies? Um, I think at the next level is, what is the funding ecosystem for the ventures that come out of the R&D ecosystem? And I think, you know, the federal government does some of that through the SBIR program and others. Those can be, there's lots of good ideas for how those can be continue to be updated and strengthened. But what is then that ecosystem of venture capital and others? And I think there are certainly VCs who are trying to innovate on this, but VC came, you know, really made its um, uh, bones on software. And I think thinking about what are the mix of uh, funding vehicles that are gonna help uh, really grow this. So like one classic example someone gave me is, you know, in the hard tech space, there's a key challenge, which is, what they call first plant risk. So you have developed some core technology that is showing really high results. You need to have the financing to build the first major manufacturing plant to make it at scale. You know, that's like this weird middle area where you don't usually go to VCs to build your first manufacturing plant. But usually if you went to project finance folks, they would say, oh, well, how many other of these factories have you built? And you say, no, this is my first one, you know? Uh, and so, there are ways that we have to build capital structures to sort of catch people at all the key growth points, just like we do this with in the software space where we have seed rounds and series and others. And so I think people are starting to think about this and saying, look, if we want this ecosystem to thrive, we have to let people, because I think it's easy to say we need more SpaceX's. We actually have to think about, there were so many points for Tesla or SpaceX where they could have run out of money because you know Tesla had these problems around how do we get the production capacity up, and you know as uh, you know um, you know like actually producing cars at scale is as much of an engineering challenge as making the first one, uh, and so I, so yeah. I think <laughs> so I think thinking about those elements and how to finance them ends up mattering a lot. So we have about five minutes left, and I feel like we have to talk about what happened over the weekend. And uh, a lot has happened between Reboot Day 1 and Day 2. 
uh, namely we have a new administration and a uh, different makeup of the House and Senate. And I would love to hear from each of you um, two or three actionable policy recommendations for this next Congress and next administration. Kumar, do you wanna start? Sure, yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, I think this was, it was right there in their, um, you know, speeches that the president-elect and the vice president-elect gave on Saturday night, which is they talked about putting science and the forces of hope right there in the center of the administration. Since then, the transition website has been posted and they've got a series of proposals, both on economic recovery, on climate and on COVID. And I think like, there's pretty serious uh, things that they've already put on the radar screen. So for example, the idea that we should be using the Defense Production Act to be able to accelerate production on key items in COVID response. The fact that we need to be using, uh, you know, data science to better understand and track the disease. So um, my sense is that, you know, there's, if I had a couple of sort of top line things, I think one is government should be thinking very aggressively about how to use its procurement authority you know, similar to what Eli was saying, that often we just think about innovation on just the R&D side of the ledger. But government as purchaser is actually a really powerful vehicle. So the classic example of this is, hey, you know, you can actually boost the production of the electrical vehicle, the electrical vehicle market by actually having the government actually become a major purchaser, right? You can actually, so what are ways that its procurement authority can thrive on what it wants to see? I think a second area is, you know, um, there's a lot of interest in using the way that DARPA invests in R&D and actually carrying that across a number of the broader set of federal agencies. And so there's interest in bringing that to HHS. Uh, there's interest in how to bring that to, you know, you know, the Department of Labor and other parts of the government. And I think that obviously has to be done thoughtfully, but this idea that we need to be doing more breakthrough R&D um, I think is going to matter a lot on a number of our challenges. And then I would say the last thing is that um, government is going to have to uh, rebuild. There's been a lot of brain drain. And I think issuing a call to technologists to come and serve is going to matter a lot. And I think um, the only way you actually make all these things work, especially on the, is if, if people are sort of hearing this conversation and saying, oh my God, I really do think we could be doing a better job on, you know, uh, how the government invests in hard tech. You know, those are actually jobs that, you know, uh, NIH or HHS or DARPA and others. And it'd be great to have people sort of uh, actually sit in those roles and actually uh, make government work better. Eli, what about you? Um, so I I thought it was very inspiring what, what uh, Joe Biden said uh, over the weekend about, you know, it's time to heal the country. Um, and, you know, I, I just think, you know, the best way to do that is to actually um, do <laughs> address a lot of these issues that Kumar and 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 and, and has been saying, and, and that that we've all been talking about. Uh, you know, we need broad based growth in this country so that people aren't hurting so much, and that so that people aren't acting in a zero sum way. And the country's lost its mind for the last four years, and and you know, I, I think that this is. A lot of the reason why is that is that um, it is kind of a fixed. It has been kind of a fixed pie, and we need to grow the pie, so that everybody can can uh, you know feel uh, like their way of life isn't so threatened. Um, and and so I you know if I you know if I had five minutes with with the vice president or the president elect, I would say you know like. I, I think that your your impulse to heal the country is exactly 100% right. And, and like the way to do that is is to try to grow the economy as much as possible in the next four years. Um, and, and in terms of specific things that, you know, like I, I already mentioned focused research organizations, I think it's like a great thing to, to make a big bet on, you know, uh, maybe a, a billion dollars, uh, you know, which would fund, you know, a, a dozen or so of these uh, FROs. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, I think working on, on permitting, I think would be uh, a, a really big deal um, in terms of, you know, find, find um, you know, ways that you can develop like sort of categories of activities that, that can be exempt from some of these, these permitting uh, requirements. Um, so, so that's, to me, like that, that's the, that's the big thing. He's, he's on the right track. And, um, and, you know, I hope that, uh, I hope that, you know, 
he can deliver that, that sort of like healing through economic growth over the next next four years. That's great. Kumar and Eli, thanks so much for this. And I just have one last thing, a plug that I have to make for Reboot, which is if you go to their website and you on the main page, they have these postcards. They're in the public domain. You can click through them and they are visions, drawings um, made in the 1890s of what the year 2000 would look like. And the technologies in them are amazing. There's like flying firefighters and levitating cars and all of the, you know, elect, um, automatic barbers and all of these things. So I would love it if we all took a few minutes to make our own postcards of what like the year 2050 looks like and what amazing hard tech innovations we can come up with and then and then put ourselves to the test. So thank you all. Thanks Reboot for having us. All right, thanks so guys. Much. Yep. Bye-bye.